Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Coach Kasim back here again for another talk today. I am talking with Ben Yanes. I thought this would be a fitting point in the timeline to get him on uh, with the upcoming event that we have in March, where I will be doing a debate with Pat Davidson. Um, so, Ben, really quickly before we get started, why don't you let people know kind of who you are, where you're from, what you do? Yep. So, uh, like you said, my name is Ben, and I am currently a sort of personal trainer. I've moved a, a lot away from that, but I'm I'm just the typical failed athlete turned, you know, personal trainer. And, um, you know, I got into this whole biomechanics thing a number of years ago, really in, in college. And so uh, what I do now is I mostly work with working one-on-one -on -one with personal trainers uh, and just, and just helping them in, in their sort of process of education around exercise mechanics and biomechanics and all those sorts of things. So um, you know, sort of in the sort of pseudo social media education sphere. Uh, and I have a couple of groups that, you know, uh, like I said, are, are full of personal trainers who just basically want to learn more about lifting. And, you know, obviously I've, I've, I've learned a lot of, you know, stuff from you too. And I'm, I'm sure we'll get into a lot of that, but uh, that's currently where I'm at. So some personal training, some teaching kind of in the middle at the moment, but um, over time has shifted more toward the education side of things, um, at least based on where I'm currently at. So that's pretty much it in, in a nutshell. Now you were at what at N one in what is it December twenty twenty one? Um, I think it was actually uh February. It was about a year ago uh today, or a yeah. year ago, you know, and, and then some. So about a year, yeah. All right. So give me the cliff notes of what the experience has been like post N one, and then the things that you've done between then and now in terms of more educational stuff, or just like you know where your thought process has gone since then. Oh, that's a loaded question. I would say that the the biggest change like pre and, and, and post seminar, because the seminar for me was something that was like super, super dot connecting. So I had a, a lot of these ideas sort of floating around my head and I felt pretty good on, you know, a, a majority of the vocab and just all the basic stuff that like people just kind of need to memorize, like origins, insertions, all that bullshit. And, and the seminar was great because it kind of got right to the point, all, all that stuff. And it, and it dove very, very quickly into the application side of things. So, um, you know, uh, that that kind of question of like, what do you do on Monday with like the weekend seminar or whatever seminar that's a little bit longer was was really, really answered well with this, because immediately you could just go into the gym and be like, oh, I've, I've been having this client who has had this issue with this exercise and I've been using X, Y, Z, Q, nothing's working. Maybe they're getting pain. Maybe they can't press. And then you kind of realize like 90% of the stuff that, you know, people deal with, you know, we'll, we'll call our, our normal sort of average population deals with in the gym from, you know, a problem-based standpoint can be sort of reconciled through just improving setup and, and having a more specific goal with an exercise. I actually find that like the greater the amount of specificity, whether that be, you know, we're trying to target more total tissue or less, right? Specific, not necessarily meaning like specific tissue, but more like specificity of goal. The specificity of goal thing, I think is something that actually clears a lot of things up as well. So those two kinds of things like in tandem of just like paying heavy, heavy attention to, to, to set up and specifically like context around the goal, the more precise you can be with the goal. Like I said, whether it be being more specific with your tissue, you know, targeting or less um, either way, I think it, it really just makes for a better overall um, client experience. And the cool thing about that too, is it's like, you know, my, my training partner is a pro bodybuilder and, you know, I train my gen pop client, who's my cousin, who's never lifted before in his life. And the great thing about the sort of application based stuff is it's based on principle. It's not based on like memorizing a definition or memorizing a specific motion. So, you know, when you go from training someone who's 280 pounds and like, you know, of five, 10% body fat to like someone who needs to lose 40 pounds, <laughs> you know, a little bit of a different situation, right? But all of the principles overlap. And so despite how different those two contexts can actually be, it's really, really cool to kind of just see how easily that can transfer when you actually know like what you're looking for and you know what to look for within that sort of subcontext, if that makes sense. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's it's great to hear that like a lot of this stuff was easy, easily applied 
right and made a big difference because that's essentially what we're going for um but then you you went in and you did some other stuff afterwards right so tell me about that and whether or not that kind of kept you on the same path or whether that kind of deviated you from some of the n1 stuff yeah so um i got into the rts stuff tom stuff probably like d definitely before i came to to n1 so i i had kind of a lot of that stuff sort of um you know moving around my head just in terms of trying to piece together a lot of the stuff that that tom talks about but i would definitely say that i've gone over all of the the course material that he's put out like three four or five times as many times since then so what i would say is that the rts stuff and the n1 stuff are you know collectively i think really complementary in some ways but it really just depends i think for most people on like what their actual level of interest in the topic is versus the outcome so i think a lot of people especially you know trainers too they don't necessarily want to like you know get into like resultants and component forces but like maybe they want to just know how do i train my rear delts a little bit more effectively and how do i do that for my clients so for me personally i just like love the topic um, and so I think that actually, for the most part, with maybe a few exceptions on just some, you know, more muscle specific stuff, I think that the uh, stuff I've learned from RTS has actually enhanced my understanding of N1 and, and sort of vice versa. Um, because I think that with the RTS stuff, you're really able to zoom in on maybe the rationale behind a lot of the, you know, specific motions that you guys teach and the specific reasons for, you know, different kinds of setups. Um, and so I think that like, it, it really works well both ways, but I think, um, that it only works well both ways when you're super interested in the nuance stuff. Uh, and not necessarily just the outcome, because I do find that a lot of people who even people who like will say on social media like to like teach this stuff is they more so just want to know like, oh, I, if I put my arm here, that's like rear delts. And if I put my arm here, it's lats. They don't really want to know like what what is an internal moment arm and like why does that affect what's recruited kind of a thing. So for me personally, it's definitely enhanced my understanding of both, like I said, minus maybe a few like muscle specific stuff um, you know, which we can get into or not, but, um, that, that's what I would say overall is like, it's definitely been more of like a two plus two equals five scenario, as opposed to anything that's really, um, you know, changed my mind significantly about anything. So what I would say is that it's more so explains some of the reasons why you guys do certain things. Um, but like I said, m many people probably aren't looking for that kind of detail, but for me personally, like, teaching this stuff becomes infinitely easier when you can zoom really, really, really far in and then have the perspective to be able to actually step back and speak in a little bit more of a generalized way to someone because you're able to actually dive into that nuance if you actually need to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's principally, I would think that, you know, I mean, what we do has a very strong physics base, but we're looking at the neurology and everything with it right so that you know they shouldn't be they shouldn't deviate too far from each other on most things unless somebody's doing the math wrong basically right yeah yeah um so when you when you were here and then shortly after that's kind of when you went ham on social media right and like just kind of kind of blew yourself up and you took you took a route of taking this information <laughs> and basically basically delivering it in a in a in a in a meme format or what i would say is kind of a more um hyperbolic format if you will um which we know that type of stuff um performs well on social um but i think in private conversation we've had you've had you know kind of a a, a love and a hate with that type of format and uh i can say that's you know it's been the same thing you know on this side in terms of observing that so i mean like full disclosure like with this whole like this anti-optimal you know movement or whatever that kind of started in the last like year and a half or however long it's been going on um i don't know it's probably been going along longer than i'm aware of it or whatever because i'm not on the TikTok and whatever um but it's it's been interesting on our perspective because the majority of the criticisms or the majority of the the shots that have been taking taken at like n1 you know by these by this group of people 
actually has nothing to do with our direct content and had everything to do with people's content that was associated with us. So like there's a whole bunch of TikTok influencers that were basically just, you know, putting a ton of N1 stuff on there. And of course, there it's never the people that are coming to the courses. It's always the people that are just seeing stuff on social and, you know, they're posting things without nuance and, and without context. And that's always, you know, been an uphill battle. Um, and then here comes Mr. Ben Yanes, right? <laughs> comes to the course, goes home. And then it's like full fledged meme war against everybody, um, which I mean, I won't deny the entertainment value of watching it. But what I will say is, is like of all of the challenges that from a business perspective that we have faced, the the ability or we'll say like, how do I say this? That when people take our content and they kind of put it in this, they strip the context and they put it out in that form it makes it much more vulnerable to criticism, critique and whatnot, because a lot of what we teach is very nuanced and context based. Right. Um, and I mean, you've been to the course, you know, we talk about the principles of thresholds and how this stuff aligns and whatnot. Um, so I'm just curious um, how you got on that route. Uh, you know, what your thoughts are about it looking back and, you know, kind of what you think the the pros and the cons are of that. Yeah. So, first of all, there was a little bit of a buffer period. Okay. It wasn't like I left the course and then I went home and I was like, you know what? I'm going to take everything I learned in the course. So I'm just going to put it in a meme. No, but um, you know, I, I think it was inspired actually by um, accounts that were not at all related to the fitness realm, because, you know, when I look at like the social media sort of fitness sphere, specifically in regard to like people who are talking about hypertrophy, 99.99999% of people are doing the same thing, right? It's kind of like, it's, it's a, it's a sequence of events every single time. It's like, okay, someone like you put something up, whether it be, you know, one of like your finalized exercises or just a very brief explanation about something, you put it in a video, you say, Hey, this is for this thing. And then some TikTok influencer who now is probably big on like the Instagram reels thing, repost it in like a, a slightly less contextualized way or completely non-contextualized way and says, Hey, do this. This is the best thing for this thing. Right. With again, without any of, of, of the nuance. And then what happens from there is like, that's kind of initially what popularizes it. Cause like you have, you have a good following, but like if someone with a million followers re reposts or, or someone who has, you know, millions and millions of accounts to reach on a post, it's like that, that will just explode it in a week. And then from there, it's kind of like this trickle down effect where everyone is just making the same reel that just like looks slightly different from the last one. And so it was like there was there was nothing special about that to to me that was like actually valuable. It was kind of just like, OK, no one's really teaching anything. People are kind of just reposting the same video that Cass originally posted three months ago. They don't even probably know originally where it come from. But like, cool, you know, maybe they get a few likes, maybe they get a, a few follows from it. And so I was like, OK, let me just like try to just go completely 180 in a different direction and let me just try to move away from video format right now and just like see how the whole carousel thing works. Because the carousel thing is like, you know, if you can put 10 pictures in an actual post, that to me is like you have 10 opportunities for someone to actually resonate with one of those 10 things to actually share your stuff, right? Rather than this one video that, you know, is not only is it probably not polarizing the video, but it's also like, uh, you know, someone has one opportunity to, to share the, the video or the post. And it's likely that because it's not a message, they're not going to share it. So I was like, how do I maximize shares here? And so that's kind of the direction that I went. It actually had nothing to do directly with like the biomechanics and the messaging. And of course, from there, it got a little bit, you know, hectic at times, but that's kind of, to me, it was, was the origin. So, you know, in terms of the pros, it's like, there are a ton of pros because there are a ton of pros, we'll say in or under the category of like opportunity for shares, accessibility to people who maybe don't understand like more nuanced terminology and, and contextualization. 
Um, but with that, you just get a sort of higher magnitude of, of everything else, right? So you get a higher magnitude of people who um, are just assholes and like want to say the meanest thing to you. You get um, a higher magnitude of people who say the opposite. They say, oh my gosh, like I've never been able to understand this kind of thing before. And these things actually made them uh, understandable to me, even though some, some of them, yes, like may have been a, a little bit more uh, edgy than, than, than others. Um, you know, there were sort of increased levels of of stress or or stimulus, if you want to call it that, in both domains, positive and negative. Um, and so for me, it's just like, and this could be just, you know, my bias in terms of the people that actually reach out to me. But so many people have have said the same thing along the lines of like, you know, this information has never really been this accessible to me. And like, because I was able to relate to this, like one thing where, you know, you made a joke about feeling this and this exercise. And like, I made this change that you recommended, and it totally, you know, uh, uh, changed the game for me, you know, that kind of a thing, I think is the positive side of it that really has kept me going. And over time, and for anyone who's been, you know, following me for the last year, I think maybe they can see this, maybe they 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 haven't. But especially since I've talked to you uh, about it, I've tried to be less, um, not not necessarily less extreme, I would say, but more so like less personal, more more focused on ideas, if that makes sense. So rather than saying like, you know, you're an idiot if you think this, um, I'll say like, this is not a great idea kind of a thing. And so, um, you know, that sort of change in messaging, I think drastically has changed the amount of negative interactions that I've been having, um, which is like, yeah, duh, obviously. Um, but it's also obviously, you know, decreased the reach of, of um, you know, just generally speaking, we'll say my reach in a week, a month, uh, a couple months. And so that's the trade-off that I've kind of been uh, dealing more with and, and kind of how I've redistributed my time away from that is I've focused on making like longer format YouTube stuff. Um, and so uh, that that gives me an opportunity for people to actually maybe see a little bit more of my personality um, rather than just like this, this name behind these memes. Uh, because, you know, over time, especially because I'm like fairly young now, I don't want to develop as this person who is like, oh, Ben, like that's the meme guy, right? Like you have glute guy, uh, you know, who's in his 40s now. And like, I'm the meme guy in my 40s. Like, that's not something, you know, I see uh, being a future for myself. So while I still do uh, think that it is useful in some ways, I've, I've, I've kind of toned it down and I've focused more on the video stuff. And obviously, there, there are other things that we could get into there. But that's generally, those are generally my thoughts on, on that. So uh, it's interesting, you know, how you said you made the change and that decreased the amount of negative interactions that you're getting, um, but it also decreased the overall. So do you think the net of that, you know, is positive? Because, I mean, you know, Instagram doesn't distinguish between, you know, comments that are negative or people sharing your stuff, but they're sharing it to, we'll say, people that will have mutual hate or disdain right? Like, you know, Hey, look at what this dumbass is, you know, saying over here or whatnot. Um, because to, because to me, like, you know, the algorithm of them is meant so that, you know, if Instagram sees it's a certain type of people are engaging this, it's going to send it more to those type of people. Right. So in instance, if you're getting a lot of negative engagement, that means your content is more likely going to be shared with people that are going to negatively view it. Right. Like it's going to, you know, if, if if you if you say something negative about a particular influencer and then a bunch of their followers come and you know see you a bunch of hey well the do the dominoes are going to continue to fall and then more of that person's you know people <laughs> are going to see that right um you know so this is this is you know with me I've I've always looked at with what we're trying to do on social is it's like the quality of engagement the quality of views like I'm trying to get in front of the people that I can help not just in front of, you know, people to be in front of people's sake, like not doing it for like, Hey, how many likes, how much engagement can I can get? But actually, can I put this content in front of the people that it's going to make a difference to? Um, so I'm curious if you, you know, if you've thought about that and you think that's, you know, the direction that you're going by being a little, you know, we'll say less hyperbolic or, um, or if you just think, you know, being an asshole just does better on social media. Um, yeah, because I think better is contextual, right? Like you just mentioned. So I think it's very tough to like for me, if I had to say like positive or negative, absolutely net positive, not only because um, I typically have seen 
you know, well, just as, as one metric, not that this is like the most valuable thing, but you typically tend to see more uh, convergence with like uh, paid stuff with people who are like actually interested and actually also, you know, are, are do it for their work. Maybe they are learning for their work. So I think overall, it's probably a net positive, the sort of decrease in, in the, um, the polarizing stuff. Um, but it is difficult to say from like um, a net outcome standpoint. Um, so what I'll focus more on with this is just kind of like, I think it's been a lot better on my own uh, sort of like brain from the standpoint of not even uh, at this point, like humoring a negative interaction because it's, it's, it's so much better to just kind of focus on the, on the positive ones. Um, but I would say overall that that's probably the bigger thing for me is just like being able, f making it something that's, that's sustainable for me and making it something that, like I said, is not uh, developing uh, the wrong perception in terms of like what I actually think the value that I can provide is and what I actually think that, um, or, or how much rather I think I can actually help people because um, I, I do that, that is the thing that I think gives me the most gratification. It's not like, you know, oh my God, this posted really well. Um, Cause you know, what I found over time is as I've grown, it's like, you know, if, if, the, if, uh, if a post that I made a year ago in an hour had like a hundred likes and a post that I make in an hour now has 3000, there's no, like, there's no real difference in terms of like the sort of, uh, uh, response that I have in terms of like, oh, this thing did really well versus this thing did really well. Like it ends up being the same. And I think you hear this from people who like explode to a much higher magnitude where maybe they have millions and millions of followers and, you know, millions of likes, millions of comments. And, you know, it's basically to them, like perceptually the same as if they had, you know, a 10th of the following, a 20th of the following. So for me, it's just kind of was like learning that there was actually no difference between, you know, 10,000 and a hundred thousand. Um, the difference is actually in like how, how much meaning, how much value do you actually provide to the people that are going to like stick with you, uh, and, and see you for, for something more than just like entertainment. Um, if that, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people took, um, I, and, and in some cases, ironically, like in the, in the case of Paul Carter, who I think basically ventured on a similar path as you when, after he came to N1, he basically started posting our stuff in a very kind of like fit fluencer, you know, like, you know, if, 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 if you didn't see him, the, 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 the content could have been made by, you know, you know, a young teen TikToker, like it was that same type of, <laughs> you know, I mean, content, right. And then, you know, we had conversations like this and, you know, I think there's, I think it's ironic, you know, when you're like a 50 year old man and you're, you know, you're, you're jealous of the exposure that like some of these young kids are, are getting or whatnot. And your, your, your result is to then try and emulate that instead of like, no, like I'm the, I'm the, I'm the professional, I'm the seasoned person in this industry. I should be, you know, above that and be able to deliver something that is, you know, more valuable or whatnot. And that's what I see is, is that, you know, people should be delivering value and content relative to what they can contribute. They shouldn't be distorting their message for, you know, to try and compete with entertainment type content on these platforms. I mean, the, you know, you just have to accept the reality of that's what they are. They are entertainment platforms. They are not educational um, platforms, right? It doesn't mean that from a business perspective that you can't, you know, you can't distribute information and you can't create interest in, you know, higher levels of thinking. It just means that like, look, you can't expect that, you know, that type of content is going to be the same, but it's simply, it's just, there's just not, there's not as many people on Instagram, you know, to want to learn something or think as much as there is people that want to, you know, just scroll thoughtlessly and, and be entertained. Um, so who, who who would you say kind of stands out in terms of the people who you know you kind of like you know rub the wrong way or ruffled the feathers list with this approach right aside from me <laughs> well um i mean paul is definitely one of them but paul actually weirdly like um a, i think he i think he hated me like before i i started growing a lot like he hated me originally because of the because i told him that the overhead extension thing was like going to be a great amount of like long head stimulus. Uh, that was like really the impetus. If, if, if you can believe that, which I'm, I'm sure you can. 
Um, I would say that without specific name calling, um, because I, I don't necessarily think that will that will help anyone. I usually find that it's the same category of person, right? It's usually someone who is or feels like they're established in their sort of uh, whether it's the fitness industry as a whole, they're established because they're huge or whether it's like a specific domain within a specific category. Yeah. Gatekeepers is probably the word you're thinking of, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Right. right. It's like this older per it's, but it's, it's really funny to me in some ways how it's always the same person. Like it can, it could, it could be a guy, it could be a girl. Right. But it's always sort of underlying is the same issue. It's like, I'm this insecure person who like can't stand to see anyone grow in any sort of uh, a public way that may actually hurt my business in some way. Cause I think it's also tied to that um, or, you know, influence the people that I'm trying to influence. It's like this really, it's like this really obvious, like scarcity mindset. Um, like for me and, 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 you know, the people that I sort of see coming up on, on social media now, and the people that are sort of around where, where I'm at, I'm like rooting for people who I think, you know, have good things to say and have value to provide. I'm not like, um, holding back and, uh, you know, uh, hoping like for their demise or anything. So I just think that again, without saying names, cause I don't want to like, you know, get killed here, uh, that, it always many, tends huh? to be, <laughs> yeah, well, not that many, but just people that who will say are, you know, have may have access to me occasionally on, you know, physically. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, I would say, I would say that's generally the archetype is like male, usually thirties to forties established, uh, respected in some regards, uh, you know, worried about, worried about the come up, you know, worried about the yeah. come up. Yeah. I think insecurity in this age that is fast changing leads to a lot of gatekeeping behavior where people want to shut down any new ideas or, you know, things that they see is like, you know, trending away from, you know, their traditional biases. Um, what's yep. ironic though, right. In my experience, um, having people like voice disagreement, um, with our content, like, so, you know, the people that, you know, I have gone back and forth, whether it be, you know, Mike Isretel or, you know, Pat or Brett or whatever, like, like actually that's been some of the best, like we'll say um, some of the best opportunities for growth um, in, in our business, because when somebody, when somebody disagrees with you or has a, you know, a conflicting viewpoint, it gives you it, like, it creates the opportunity for you then to talk about what you do. Right. And for you to talk about it in a more, detailed manner. So, you know, I think that if you actually believe in what you do, or you think you're on the right path or whatnot, you should welcome as many of those opportunities, because you're basically those people are soliciting you to talk about what you do and, and how your view is different. Um, and so like that has actually been, like, I would say, extremely beneficial to our business is the people that like do like, you know, come up and be like, Oh, I have this, you know, a specific critique of the way you guys programming or, you know, the way you're looking at things and, and whatnot. And it's like, awesome. So now I can, now I can answer that question, you know, that has been solicited to me and it gets significantly more engagement when those topics have been solicited by somebody else in the industry. than if I were to just come out and just, you know, try and spout a bunch of nuanced content, I don't know. And we're talking like a hundred fold more interest when that, when that content has been solicited by somebody else's contrarian opinion. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's funny because ironically, the people that have been the best for us growing our business, but also expanding our principles and stuff have not been the people that copy our stuff, you know, and then share it or whatever and whatnot, you know, and then it gets blasted all over. That's actually had a negative impact. It's been the other, it's been the people that are actually contrarian that then give us an opportunity to actually expand on that where i'd say the most negative thing you know or the 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 most definitely in terms of like my personal work in terms of dealing with all the social media stuff or whatever has been you know like for instance you know i'm having this thing with pat you know and a lot of pat's you know criticisms that could be associated with us you know, are directed by you at you or or somebody else that's like 
you know, kind of using the content and whatnot. And that's the, like, that's the tough thing. Like I had that debate with Brett. I wouldn't even call it a debate. It was just a three hour, just like snooze fest (laughs) really. But the irony is, is that Brett was coming at me for things that other people had said that Paul Carter, like mostly things that Paul Carter had said or whatnot, um, you know, and I, you know, some things that you had said, whatever. And so when I'm put in the place where instead of that being the opportunity where I get to talk about my stuff, I have to like, now, now I'm in the situation where I'm having to defend the people that disagree with me against content that is just, <laughs> that is similar to ours, maybe in semantics or look, but it's not quite delivering the same message or whatever. That's actually been um, the most challenging thing. So, you know, for anybody listening or whatnot, right? Like, don't be jealous of people like that are coming up. If anything, you should welcome all those opportunities, right? Um, I think what hurts the what 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 hurts more is it people that agree with you, but they agree with you very poorly, right? Like you know, like the last thing that you want is somebody you know trying to make an argument on your behalf and then completely just you know fumbling it, right? Um, yeah. Anyway, and I- go ahead. Well, I was just going to say is like, I have done, uh, I would say a fair amount of like, just one on one, uh, like teaching and, and educating, but obviously, like a fraction of, you know, what what you have done and, and what you will continue to do. So I have seen this play out on like, you know, a scale that is much, much, much smaller. And it could even be like, you know, someone at my gym, it's like, Oh, Ben said this thing about this thing. And then I talk to someone else, you know, and they come over and they're like, Oh, this other trainer said that you said this thing about this exercise. So like, I should do it this way. Right. And I was like, well, no, 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 no. Like, that's not (laughs) like, that's not going to work for you. Right. So I, I understand it, uh, like conceptually, but I think I'm yet to sort of have to deal with the wrath of it in terms of like it affecting, you know, me, me individually or, or my business or anything else. So, you know, I'm trying to sort of get ahead of maybe the problems that will potentially start to arise at a greater scale. So it's, it's good to hear that, I I guess, uh, from someone who's experienced, (laughs) someone who's experienced it. Take, take it, take, for example, something as simple as an iliac pull down, which is simple, which is just basically putting a name for, Hey, here's, here's what this thing is more specifically used to, right? So you take away, you take away the, like, it's an iliac pull down and just say, Hey, it's a one arm cable pull down or whatever. And then nobody has a problem with it. People have been doing it forever or whatever. All we did is add a little bit of specificity to the setup and say, okay, if you do that, then now your goal is a little bit more specific here. Um, but what happens is then a narrative will now be formed around that. So now like that's, that's the shot to be taken at of like, okay, now if I'm going to talk about, you know, how stupid optimal training is, I'm just going to use this. I'm just going to use the narrative of, Oh, it's the Iliac pull down, you know, is the problem. And it's like, okay, at what, at what angle does the, of, of, of holding a cable (laughs) does now the exercise become the bad guy. Right. Um, you know, and so that that's that that's the problem with like all of a sudden this is like basically because people won't go through the effort to really break down the ideas. But if you repeat something over and over and over to negatively to give something a negative association, it becomes truth. And that's 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 what I that's what I see. And that's the challenge now, because this happens on a big enough scale that now it's like, OK, these people don't have to understand it. All they do is they hear the word, the right words. And now there's a negative association with that. That's those are going to be the biggest obstacles to getting these ideas out to more people and having them be receptive because the people that, you know, would be are now going to be the hardest to reach are going to be the people that are just going to be completely dismissive because as soon as they hear a couple of these terms, they're just immediately going to assume. You see the same thing happen in, you know, our culture and politics and whatnot. That's essentially what happens, right? It's like everything becomes bipartisan and it's like you hear the right buzzword and you know exactly which side of the fence that you sit on. Mm -hmm. Um, And you see that, that same thing happening. Right. And I don't know if there's anything that I can do about that other than just keep doing what I'm doing. Um, But that's, that's the scenario. we're in. So I think we're about, you know, we're a good half hour into this. So why don't we roll around to the, like, you know, some of the more interesting technical things or whatever, um, in terms of some content or whatnot, if you have anything you want to throw my way in terms of stuff that like you, you know, 
you've done an N1 or whatever or things that you've seen that you think, you know, weren't like that. You're like, oh, I don't know if I still agree with that or whatever. Um, but why don't we start with uh, why don't we start with the deltoid training thing? Um, and then we can just kind of organically move around, move around from yeah. there. Right. So, yep. um, so I'm looking at uh, a post here. Um, I believe, you know, it's on rear delts and um, the message is, is that because the rear delts, I think, I believe you say just do extension in this case, which hopefully we both know that that's not true. Um, but basically since they only act between the scapula and the humerus, that basically you should keep the scapula still right and just do the shoulder extension is that am i interpreting that message right i mean um it me. may be it may be it may be broadly um it may be broadly what i what i said uh but i think that there would be some some nuance that i would add there if you would like me to add yeah well like okay add right so i guess the first thing is is that am i interpreting the post rightly or am, am i interpreting like that that's my interpretation of the post I'm sure like we can add nuance that isn't there, but at least if we can start with the green, that that's what the post says. Sure. We'll go yeah. with that. Okay. All right, cool. So now, <laughs> all right. Okay. So now if you want, if you want to add the nuance that that post is missing, then go ahead. Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, keeping your, keeping your shoulder blades still would be, uh, a, a way that I would communicate that, that would be, um, or, or rather, you know, the general message that I try to give is like, if, if I'm going to do something that's more proportionately rear delt, then we'll say like rhomboid trap focus, you know, I'm going to want to pick something that is, um, you know, it loaded through a range where the primary uh, moving component is the humerus and not necessarily the scapula. That being said, if you are if you are doing an exercise, let's say like a pull down or a row, and you are intentionally restricting any sort of scapular motion from happening, what you'll probably, at least in my experience, experience is something that feels like very, um, like feels very crampy and sort of like um, sensation-y and like it's a strong contraction. Um, but usually what I actually have, have found, because I've like, you know, this, this is also, even if I think something may be wrong, I'll actually try it just to be like, Hey, how does this feel? And like, what does this look like? And, you know, tr trying those kinds of things, like I said, gives you lots of sensation, but it actually, um, does not feel particularly good on, on, on your shoulder joint, whether it be like acutely or, or, you know, over the course of a couple of weeks, right. Doing an exercise. So for me, uh, it, it's, it's more so about loading a proportion of the range that I think is more biased toward, toward rear delt, whether that be like sort of an extension type motion or whether that be, you know, more of an ABA deduction type motion, depending on how you're looking at it. Um, it's not necessarily keep your scap here in this space and, and, and don't move it. It's more so uh, allow your shoulder blade to do whatever it's going to do, but use a specific proportion of a range that will more predominantly load humeral motion as opposed to scapular motion as sort of the predominating thing that's 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 doing the work if that makes sense okay and i want to dig into sensation but let's let's finish unpacking this one first so what is your thought process then on uh what would be like what why do you think that the scapula moving would in any way limit the rear delt assuming that we get the same degree of joint excursion between at the glenoral humeral joint so the way that I kind of conceptualize it is similar to how I would conceptualize like uh, hamstrings, we'll say in like a squat, but to a much, to a much, uh, to a much lower magnitude. So right? in that instance, you're talking about the muscle crossing both joints, but it's doing an opposite function, right? I would, I would disagree with that being a analogy that you could use here, right? Because the deltoids in a sense are not crossing both and if they did the function would be synergistic not opposite in this case so if you're doing if you're doing rear delts and retraction happens with that right like if we just you know came up with a hypothetical scenario where some mutant has you know rear delts that fucking jump over the scapula and all the way or whatever right? those sure. movements would be synergistic not antagonistic at the very least right but the but but they don't i mean we, we're, I don't think this is a place to get into intermuscular septums and, you know, muscles that have, you know, connections to each other's tendons and stuff like that. So for the large part, we'll just look at the delts as a, 
you know, single muscle and acting on that. So this is where it's like, you know, if we're looking at what is needed for the deltoids to contribute the most amount of force that they can get the maximum mechanical tension stimulus, you know, in that, right. That requires the most stability on the other side, right? Like the, a st- you, you need a stable scapula to pull on so that the humerus is the thing, you know, that's, that's going to move and you're going to, and you're going to drive that motion. That being said, a stationary scapula does not necessarily mean a better base of stability. The scapula orientation is going to change in order to actually maximize its ability to stabilize. So as you're going through a motion, right, and you're pulling with your rear delts, the direction of force and the amount of force that the that the delts are pulling on the scapula is changing, right? Also, the amount of force going through the sternoclavicular joint is changing as you're going through that. So when I'm looking at this, and I think, you know, the message that you said is like, well, you should just let the scapula do its thing. I think, I think that's the place to be, right? And not trying to restrict it in, in any way, because the actual most stable scapula is, is going to be when you allow the scapula to constantly be in a place of mechanical advantage, right? Because stationarily, the traps are still working, the rhomboids are still working. It's just all, all stationary in that instance means that the amount of force on both sides, it just isn't resulting in motion, right? That doesn't mean it's more stable. That doesn't like in an instance there, you could be down regulating the neural drive to the delts in order to allow the scapulas to stay, to stay still, right? So because you're constantly, you're distally going to be limited by the more proximal source of stability, right? So you'll down regulate the delts to be able to accommodate for any restriction that you're creating at the scapula versus if you let the scapula go where it's most mechanically advantaged, then we shouldn't see any down regulation of the deltoids. And at least in-house, that's exactly what we see, right? This is if you let that thing move. And in, and in some cases it needs to move fairly significantly because the orientation of the scapula needs to change so that the muscles that are supporting that can actually be better orientated to match the force that the deltoids are producing on it. Cause the direction of force that the deltoids are producing changes throughout the motion right like when your arms in front of you that's a very different force on the scapula than by the time you get into extension right so if you don't allow the scapula to move so that the appropriate things can be stabilizing it at some point in that range of motion you're essentially creating a point of we may be stationary but we actually can produce less force in the deltoids because it's less stable despite being stationary right it's less ability to support that Right. Oh. So the way that I was, the way that I was kind of conceptualizing from, from the hamstrings perspective was not necessarily in terms of like opposition of joint action, but more so in terms of like relative length change within the different portions of uh, extension, flexion, mm-hmm. adduction, abduction. So for example, like if I'm going to do, we'll say like a horizontal row, right? Like this one that like everyone says, Oh, 45 degrees, you know, like this is rear delt. And like, if you go up here, like there's no rear delt there. Um, if you're in that like 45 degree extension plane, there is a disproportionate amount of scapular motion. We'll say into in toward the spine toward the tail end of the extension portion of that range, right? So like the amount of retraction that I will have from here to here, as you mentioned, sort of indirectly with the the whole force direction conversation is different from the amount of retraction that I'll have in this sort of end degree of extension, right? To get to max extension, you have that elevation portion as, as well. So the way that I was, or the way that I sort of do conceptualize it, not necessarily as much in terms of in terms of a pull down, um, but when people do do upper back pull downs, I th- I feel like they basically turn it into like a horizontal motion by just like extending the shit out of their lumbar spine anyway. So with any sort of like maximum retraction based motion, the way that I'm looking at it is more like, okay, I'll get to a point where again, the, uh, I'm going to sort of allow the shoulder blade to move as I think that it's naturally meant to move, uh, in the cases where people aren't sort of like, you know, in a state where they've trained themselves out of that natural motion. Um, uh, but I'm not going to go to the tail end of that range where I may actually start to sort of feed more into, we'll say the shortened position or the most shortened position of, um, you know, the rhomboids and, and the middle traps. 
et cetera. So typically what I see not only with, not only in my own training, but like with, with clients is that when they perform maximum retraction based rows, again, not necessarily, um, like with, with the intent even to retract as much as possible, just, Hey, like pull your arms as far back as you can. They tend to fatigue much more in what we'll call like mid back as opposed to rear delt. Whereas when someone is doing a motion that maybe again, not intentionally cuts the scapular motion short, but just lets the scap move to where maybe the humerus is in line with, with the frontal plane, or maybe even slightly behind, they tend to feel proportionately much more rear delt fatigue. So it's more so like if there's just a hundred percent of the range of extension that I have in that plane, I'm going to use maybe 80% of it. If I want more of a rear delt focus, and then I may actually, you know, do it like a separate exercise. That's more predominantly for that fully shortened position, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, so a couple things here. One is, um, the, the upper back pull down, it actually should be what people are doing, meaning that they're getting a bunch of arch and do like, what's interesting is somehow this, this is how this happens, right? Is when we're like, okay, when we switch to like, Hey, you know, well, if we're going to do pull downs, we're going to use the rib cage a little bit more. We're going to be, you know, from scapular plane to all the way across the body. Like that's the spectrum we're going to go. We're not going to go like full frontal plane is what we do for the upper back pull down is not just a frontal plane vertical like that is not the upper back pull down yeah right but that's been the message it's like oh this is the up no the upper back pull down actually is like lean back with extension so that it is actually more rowy it's it's doing the it's basically doing a wide row in the pull down station but yep. what has but what has changed is now people are saying like oh they say that doing the pull down like this is not lat so whatever and it's all upper back well that's not actually true because the the upper back pull down is like a very it's more of a high row right from from that position but if you look at a lot of people when they just go to the gym and they would do that exercise that's what they would do right but now the narrative is like again like people 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 move like the goalposts to be like, Oh, look, see, this has got to be still be lats or whatever. Right. Because, you know, the, the posterior delts, even the most medial fibers don't pull like straight down. They're still going to pull into some maybe duction back here. So in order for me to be here, I would have to crank this up like that. So that is actually like, that is the correct way to do the upper back pull down. Um, is what I would say is, is like just simply using a wide path in like a pure frontal plane right? That's just, to me, that's just a less ideal lat exercise, but it's not a good upper back exercise in order for it to be a good, you know, rear delt, more lower trap, you know, all of that stuff. Then we, we actually have to get that arch in there so that we can actually be more in the plane of the posterior delts, right? Otherwise we're just doing, you know, what I would argue is just a li more limited range, you know, lat pull down, which by all means, if you put enough effort and volume in this stuff, you know, it'll, you know, it'll still work just like chin ups and all that stuff can still work just fine. Um, so then the next part there where we're looking at, okay, you know, trying to separate the motions and, and not go all the way back. My first question would be, you're saying that people are getting the upper back to the upper back is fatiguing first, right? You know, rhomboids, traps, et cetera, are fatiguing first. How are you coming up with that? I would say that it's mostly a uh, like subjective metric. Okay. Cause right? I would so argue like, that that's so like, a near oh, impossibility. So like, Oh my God, my middle back is on fire. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. I don't feel my rear delt. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. So there's a couple, there's a couple things that can be going on, but um, you having like the RTS background do a little mental work here, right. To try and figure out how, much force like the rear delts have to apply having a having basically having a moment right to extend the shoulder versus the traps the rhomboids right i mean they do have a moment to rotate the scapula but when it comes into retraction they really have they really have no moment arm to disadvantage their force meaning that they're basically pulling in a parallel motion right meaning that pretty much a hundred percent of the tensile force leads to pulling the scapula, right? Mm -hmm. The yep. torque is only about the rotation. So 
you would have to have, right? Like the most large, strongest, like inhuman posterior deltoids for them to be the thing that for the, for the upper back to then become the limiter because it's mechanical advantage is so much larger. That doesn't mean that people won't feel like, you know, especially if people aren't used to actually doing that, it doesn't mean that people won't get a pump there, that they won't be feeling it there. But the other thing we're talking about this subjective, right? If somebody say they start losing shoulder extension, okay. But in their brain, what they're trying to do is pull these handles back. How do you differentiate between, well, it's the delts that can't pull it back more and the traps are now trying to drive more of the motion with the retraction versus it being the other way around like how do you how do you how do you how do you take that subjective nature and be like oh this must be go what's going on right because from a neurological perspective when we're looking at it and if we're looking at it from a force perspective the rear delts are going to be the are going to be the limiter there right there's just you just would basically have to ignore the physics and ignore what we see you know on emg to be like oh yep upper back is is failing right it's likely more that the delts are failing and then the upper back is all that you have. Like that's now actually trying to do more of that motion. And so the sensation relative to that is going to increase because I bet you, if you take these same people that are fatigued and then you just had them do straight retraction exercises, they could just fucking go reps on reps on reps on reps <laughs> on reps. No problem. No problem. The limiter is the delts, right? And this is a, this is an easy experiment that you guys can do at home, right? Is if you take a set of rear delt rows all the way to failure, right? Like until you can't get back, like you can even like, you can't even get it partial, whatever, right? And then all of a sudden you just say, fuck the shoulder extension movement and you just try doing scapular retraction, you'll just be able to keep going reps, 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 like no problem. Like the amount of load that you can retract versus the amount of load that you could do in like a row for loading shoulder extension, it's not even close. It's not double. It's like, it's gonna be like, you know, four times the amount of load that you could retract versus what you could do in a shoulder extension moment, just because of the change in leverage, even though the leverage on the muscles doing the retraction is essentially the same, right? Because they're not the, the torque, the torque across the glenoral humeral joint does not necessarily transfer to them directly. So, so mechanically that makes sense to me, but how do you reconcile the subjective experience? Cause I don't think that that's something necessarily to just ignore. No, it's not. But then the question is, is like in that scenario, like, okay, so my, my question would be like, well, what, what are you trying to solve around that? Right? Like if the thing is, is like, you're just trying to get people to feel that they fatigue in the right spot, is, 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 is that what you're trying to do and not feel like the upper back fatigues? Well, well, for now we'll go with that. Right. Okay. And I mean, and that, that may be something that literally just corrects itself over time as people start continuing to do the exercise, right? Um, especially because most people are just, they're simply not good at contracting. They're probably much better at contracting their rhomboids and their traps than they are their rear delts because they use them all the time. You know, they bend over, they pick things up, they open doors, whatever, but they, they probably very rarely shorten a rear delt outside of the gym, right? You know, but they use, they're using their scapular muscles all of the time for every single thing that they do. Right. So yeah, a lot of it might be literally just allowing that person to increase the coordination at that joint, which takes, you know, will take at least like three weeks. And then from there, they'll start getting motor unit, you know, increase in motor unit recruitment in those deltoids. And over that time, what you would expect is a subjective experience starts to change as their coordination pattern gets better. And then their uh, recruitment is starting to get better, but you can't, you can't necessarily skip that time frame of somebody actually having to first learn to coordinate the movement and then actually having to be able to potentiate how many motor units they can recruit in that specific tissue. Like you can't just be like, well, here's a cue that'll jump you six weeks of work. Like <laughs> that's just, that's just not going to happen. So I think part of it is just accepting what the situation is going to be. And if you want to inform the client, like, okay, you feel that there as your delts, as you get better at doing this motion and your delts get a little bit stronger, you get better at firing them. You should start to feel them a little bit more, 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 more. Right. And lastly, you know, the other thing that you could do if like, if that's what you wanted to do is, is that you could then 
introduce exercises or some sort of mechanical drops or something like that, where you would be able to continue to work the posterior deltoids in less of their shortened position, right? And then that's likely to give you, that's likely to, if your goal is like, hey, I just want this person to feel like they, you know, their rear delts work. Well, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to work around the neurological inefficiency that they currently have, which means that you're going to have to find a way to push the stimulus further than what they would be capable of going all the way to a fully shortened position, right? So it might be, you have to do like a short, long superset or some sort of mechanical drop or some sort of, you know, supersetting the different divisions of the deltoids or something like that, right? You know, cause we have multiple posterior deltoids. We have multiple anterior deltoids. Like, I mean, we're like, I'm, I'm debating right now, trying to introduce a message to the world that we should be looking at deltoids completely differently and, and not like this front middle, back thing and actually something completely different um, uh -oh. based off of our latest research uh which i think is it's, it's really fucking good and all of the motions feel um you know amazing i mean none of these things are like hey you know we found out that the delts like do a totally different thing um but it's really improved the um the length and positions for some of these so um, just just one question for for follow-up there um Again, mechanistically, the the force argument makes sense in regard to the stuff we discussed on on the synergy, and then also just the mechanical advantage of of the of the line of pole. The we'll say the rhomboids in this case. Do you think that it is possible that something like um, length tension relationship has the potential to uh, interrupt? that sort of sequence of events from the perspective of um, once we start to get to a fully retracted and, and we'll say, we'll say like in the case of, we'll say like a, like a low to high row, for example, um, where you are loading that plane a little bit more specifically, do you think that it is, that it is a possibility that because of, of how short you're getting those fibers, that there is a little bit of uh, a, a discrepancy between force production um, we'll say, medial to the scap versus lateral to the scap? Well, one is you're taking both the deltoids and the upper back muscles to a short like tension relationship there. Like that's what you're doing is you're bringing them both to a short position. The only way that you would try that you could make that argument, I would say is, is that if you were basically holding retraction, but then trying to work the deltoid in a lengthened partial or something like that, where you'd be like, holding retraction and then doing like a, a, a thing like this. So you'd be working the delta to long muscle length while working the rhomboids and traps at a shorter retraction. I think in that case, like maybe you could, you know, try and come up with that argument. My argument would still be is, is that, well, it, the ability to extend the shoulder is not limited by how much you retract. Meaning that if you, if you lost a little bit of fully shortened capacity in the rhomboids, for example, it wouldn't necessarily mean that you couldn't fully shoulder extend. What would happen is, is the forces would equilibrate, right? Meaning that, you know, the scap would move as much as it could and you would still be able to fully shoulder extend as long as that, as long as that force was there. Right now, as we're getting into fatigue and we're going to see some down regulation of things or whatever, but you would still be able to get to full, if, you should still be able to get to full shoulder extension if you could actually get the neural drive to the deltoids in that in that scenario you just wouldn't like that's what it would be is, is you would have this kind of shoulder forward kind of thing starting starting to happen um if that were the case right but the other thing is is that you like we're looking at this kind of in a vacuum you would also see that if the deltoids are getting tired and you would start using other things right to kind of, to kind of do that right so if you're trying to do isolated shoulder extension right? What you can do is the lats can kind of contribute to this and you can then be co-contracting stuff at the sternoclavicular joint and get this, which is why you'll see that. And even lat rows as people will start to do this, right? So mm -hmm. because the lats have a longer lever for the sternoclavicular joint. So as they fatigue, you would actually lose the ability to retract first from a lat perspective, but still be able to do some, some shoulder extension. So you, when we're looking at this, it's like, okay, there's a lot of things going on with this joint, right? It's, if we start, if we start, if we start pulling it to like, okay, only these two things exist in the body, we might be able to come up with a story that makes sense. And then as soon as we're like, but in a real human, no, <laughs> that's just the fucking fantasy, right? Yeah, um, sure. So, I mean, my, 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 where I would disagree with this is that I think if we're focusing on working the deltoids is that the only message to send is, is like, look, you should, you should let the scapula do 
whatever it needs to do within reason. And like those reasons mean being like, or within reason, meaning that the scapula is moving in a plane that's synergistic to the exercise. And you're not like you're doing a row. And then also you're like shrugging up to your ear, just doing something that, you know, isn't actually in the, in the plane of the exercise. That would be my, that would be my challenge. And so that's one of the things where people have been like, Hey, you know, is this true or whatever? And so like, I mean, that's kind of like, you know, a lot of the times these discussions become, come from, you know, we have mutual followers and the people are like, Hey, what do you think of this? Cause that doesn't seem to be what you would say. Um, so I think, sure. you know, um, if you found in practice that you find ways that subjectively improve somebody's, you know, a bit, I mean, and that's essentially what you, you could be inadvertently be doing like somewhat of a mechanical drop or something there. Right. By like letting this come forward. Um, but I would say like, my suggestion would be if you want to implement those, those would be in addition to just the natural motion. Like, you know, if you wanted to do that as a, a set extension method or, or something like that, that would be the the place to like, okay, now we're going to do this with a little bit, you know, different scapular position or whatnot, you know, do it more of a length and partial or something like that. That's where I think that that stuff would be, would be valuable because I think long-term what you want is you want that improved coordination and you want that improved motor drive so that then yeah. the situation changes over time. Otherwise you might leave somebody in a position where, look, we're eliminating you from ever actually being able to do this row and really take your deltoids to failure because we're constantly throwing training wheels on the exercise. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay. Cool. Um, that was my first, I don't know if you have any other ones. I do want to talk about um, the sensation topic and maybe progressive overload. Those are kind of like the two I have on here. Um, you know, there's a couple exercise things like, you know, the, uh, can you bias the different heads of the biceps, you know, that sort of thing or whatever. But if you have, if you have one, you'd want to go through before we go through another mind, you can. Yeah. Well, something I hear come up a lot, um, is, you know, it related to sort of the, the bigger guys, like the, the, you know, the, the pro bodybuilder types who, um, I think have a lot of trouble with, not necessarily anything unilateral because unilateral, I think even becomes like more beneficial for, for a lot of reasons. Um, but with something, you know, like a press around or something like a pull around, especially the more horizontal, uh, types of those, I find that there are guys who uh, have a lot of trouble, um, resisting sort of like the torsional type forces, um, you know, longer term, especially as weights start to start to climb on the stack. Um, so, you know, just from the perspective of like, you know, the, the, the width of those guys too, it's like, obviously, you know, the, the bigger you get, the stronger you get, the more you add weight, but also the more the distance, you know, to your spine has the potential to actually, you know, increase a little bit. So in terms of just like, you know, the presses and the pull arounds, um, more so a question than sort of like a topic for, for a debate here, but um, what, what are the, some of the solutions at least, or ideas that sort of come into your, come into your head in relationship to, you know, just bigger guys losing motion um, and specifically bigger guys having tougher times with the unilateral stuff, assuming that they're, you know, a little bit more in like an ADA abduction plane, as opposed to just the more sagittal type motions. Yep. So any like basically as people put more meat on their frame, any exercises that have to wrap around the body, you're just, you're going to, you're going to lose some range of motion on those type of exercises because the, the cable is just going to start coming into them. That's just, that's just the reality of it. And so then it comes down to, well, what do you want out of this? Did you want fully shortened? Did you want fully lengthened and just not try and make the exercise what it's, what it's not right. This is where, you know, the majority of my answers are, to this are going to be like, solve it with your programming right so if it's like look you could do a pull down and then a pull around as a post exhaust right like going from short to lengthened you know and that would that would get you the whole range even in the biggest individuals right um you know it's a coordination challenge but in, there's things that i'll do with press arounds where i'll actually like i'll move my body so that i can be loading the lengthened and then i will turn like like i will basically like do this like kind of little side thing 
um, yeah, yeah. In, in the cable or whatnot, right? Um, I, I've been showing this at the practical for a while, but I've told people that if they post it on social media, that they are completely disowned because like these, are, <laughs> these are the, these are the nuances that are just not safe for social, right? They're just like, if people don't understand this thing, they're going to be like, you know, Hey, clown college here, Leo fucking like, you know, flopping around and whatever. When actually it's like, okay, this is, this is a relatively advanced technique for a specific scenario or whatever. Um, <laughs> so yeah, but you know, now it's out there in the ether. So I'm fucked. But anyway. I don't think people are going to be able to understand what you just said anyway. So yeah. Okay. Anyway. So, so there are, there's tweaks that you can make with setup, but a lot of it is just understanding, Hey, what can I do from a programming perspective? So if they're having trouble managing, you know, the rotation from a force perspective, right. It's like, okay, well, what can I do in terms of rep range or can I come into this exercise in a greater state of fatigue or can I use it as a post exhaust type, type thing? Right. Or can I perform it as, you know, cluster sets, or can I use, instead of going all the way to failure, use more of a rest pause thing. I honestly think though, like really just understanding how to place your feet and stuff will work, right? Like I'm not, you know, a bodybuilder by any means, but I don't have like, you know, a super small frame, like in terms of like width wise anyway. Right. I mean, I'm a homunculus, but like, you know, I have, <laughs> I have meat on my rib cage. Um, and, you know, I can do, you know, I can do press around and pull arounds with the full, with the full stack. Right. Um, and it doesn't mean that it's not a challenge to manage that rotation, but you know, what, what I learned is like, you know, if I'm just demoing something, I can stand here any way I want and be like, okay, here's the motion. Right. But when I'm training like that, I have to be very like all of a sudden now the height of the cable that I choose so that I can actually have a little bit more body lean. Right. So I can have the right foot back or forward and what makes a huge, huge difference, simply just setting the cable width appropriately so that I don't have to do a lot of work to get into my setup. Right. Like I don't have to have a bunch of cable travel before I actually get to the point where I'm going to start the exercise. Like those little things can go a long way to getting somebody into a more foundational place. You know, but that being said, you know, no exercise is perfect, right? There's just going to be like, look, doing a bilateral press, right? It's just simply going to have less trunk demand than, you know, coming around. So you are, you are adding a, you know, you're adding a coordination demand for rotation, right? In exchange for getting a range of motion that you wouldn't otherwise get, right? Whereas in a press, you're going to lose some range of motion. And now it's bilateral, right? So that you're going to get it like, okay, this is let this, there's a less of a coordination demand, but I'm losing that range of motion. Right. And there's a valid reason to use both of those tools. And this is where, you know, having multiple exercises and periodizing these things in can be very, very beneficial because it could be like, okay, well, in this meso, if I focus on using the more stability exercise, stable exercise, right. That loading is now going to be the novelty that allows me to push that progress, but I'm going to spend a period of time away from that most extreme range so then when i switch back now the novelty now is going to be the range of motion that's going to be the thing that maybe pushes me a little bit further right so it, you don't always have to look at like hey these exercises don't do everything all in once it's like well that's a bad thing that's also part of what allows us to periodize exercises and maintain a certain bit of novelty of stimulus you know over time right because if all well, we needed was just the one perfect exercise right like you know um, I won't bring up his name, but, you know, but there used to be a guy that's like, hey, there's only 20 exercises that you ever need to do and just fucking do those 20 exercises. Like there's so many flaws with that when it comes down to like, OK, looking at long term progress, even if I gave even if I had 20 favorite exercises, doing those 20 favorite exercises all the time would not be the best way to get long term results. Right. I mean, one, it's just unrealistic that you have 20 exercises that have every component that you'd want to. Um, but two, even if they did that you would probably run into a diminishing return because there would be no novelty to any of the stimulus anymore. Right. I mean, sure. Progressive overload is, is great, but if that's the only tool in your toolbox, toolbox, this might make the programs very, very difficult to benefit from down the road. Yeah. And I think that ends up running people into walls orthopedically as well. And load is the only thing that you think you need to change over time for sure. Um, the other thing too that came to my mind in reference to one of our earlier uh, topics about just like uh, the N one stuff and, and and the RTS stuff is like with the with the N one stuff I don't really 
I don't really look at exercises now through the lens of like a name or like a motion, but rather just like, what do I have access to and how can I actually use that? So, you know, where maybe a couple of years ago, if I went to a new gym, it would have been difficult to find ways to sort of match motions to, to, to particular goals. It's like, it really doesn't matter where I am or, or what I have access to. It's kind of like, if you, if you know what you're looking for and you, and you have a, just enough tools, like they don't necessarily even have to be the best tools. You could even use like 50% of the range of a tool, um, you know, just programming and everything and just adjusting to what you have has become infinitely easier. So, you know, rather than thinking about something as like, this is a bent, you know, this is a bench press. It's more like, this is a motion for this tissue. And when you realize that it's just a motion for a tissue and that you can actually do it, you know, in a ton of different places, then it becomes infinitely easier to actually, you know, create workarounds that work 90, 95% as well as the most optimal thing that you could have, could have done. Yeah. One of the things I tell people when they ask about like, Oh, you know, I don't have all this equipment or whatever. I'm like, look, I've, you know, I've traveled the world teaching, right? All gyms are a combination of pulleys, levers, and free weights, right? Yeah. And as soon as you understand those principles, like, hey, here's a lever. Is it a short lever? Is it a long lever? How does it move? And then it's like, okay, if I position my body like this, I can use it to work this. And if I position my body like this, I could like, so, you know, it may not like, it's definitely convenient to have amazing equipment where you just like, okay, I walk over here. I put the seat on here and I just fucking go like, that's awesome. Like from a convenience perspective, but if you have a brain, right? Basically a gym <laughs> is your own like little erector set of like, look, okay, I have a, th I have a lever. It's attached to a weight, right? If what direction does it move? Cool. How can I, how can I use that? Is that beneficial to me or not for what I'm trying to do? If not cool, there's another thing. If there's a pulley, like, I mean, you know, for, from an upper body perspective, like if you have a pulley, you could do, you should be able to do just everything, right? If all you had was free weights, you should still be able to do almost everything. If you have a couple levers and some free weights, you can do pretty much everything that you want. But like you said, sometimes it's not going to be the same range of motion. You know, sometimes it won't be the profile that you wanted, but this is where, you know, this is where programming comes into play. Like, okay, you can do instead of full range of motion, you can do partials at both ends, right? And if it has a crappy profile, you can do a reverse drop set or you can do partials at the end or, you know, pauses or whatever it may be. Like there's like, I think most people, they, they think the tool is the answer and it's not like the tool is the tool, right? How you use the tools that you have available. That's the answer, right? Yeah. Regardless of the, regardless of the tools you have. Sure. Some tools make life easier than others, right? But you should still be able to get the job done. Yeah. The other week I used the, uh, the Atlantis row backwards to do a, to do a costal press around. It was fantastic. I got a few weird looks, but you know, it was, yeah. it was worth it. It was worth and it. That's, that's one of the nice things about having your own stuff is, is that like, hey, nobody can fucking say shit because I've done the same thing with the prime <laughs> pull down. Like, hey, I wanted to, I'm like, I bet I could use this. And I, then I could have a torque arm to be able to actually do like the costal press with or whatever. Right. So I just yeah. ripped the seat out of it and then just, just use it or whatever. But yeah, you know, <laughs> I mean, I don't know that you're going to do that like in, in any gym or whatever, but you know, at the same time, like if you enjoy tinkering around and playing around with this stuff, that's a different that's a different thing. Like, like if you want to spend that time to make an exercise feel a couple percent better or have a little bit better profile or whatever, you're not doing that because then you're going to go do that exercise and like not work hard or, you know, whatever. Right. You're doing that just because you're like, look, for me, it's interesting. And I enjoy doing the little things to make it those small few percentage points better. Right. But that doesn't necessarily like usually those people, those people are that way about every aspect of their training. Right. They're going to be monitoring their progressive overload better and their effort and like all, all of this stuff. Right. Like if you care that much, those ironically, those tend to be the people that actually care about all the variables in training. It's not like, well, <laughs> I like to tinker around, but then once I have it set up, you know, then I don't go past RPE for it. Right. You know, like, <laughs> okay. like, yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, as much as people want to push that narrative. I just don't, I just don't see it. I just don't see it. What I do see is people that have no idea what they're doing or why they're doing. They're just copying. They're just doing monkey see monkey do or whatever. And then like, sure. But those are the same, like the same people that sandbag it in a, an iliac pull down are the same people that are sandbagging it on their, on their squat depth, you know, on their, on, on, on everything. Right. You know, they're like across the board, right. They're not managing recovery or, or any of those things. Right. You're not going to have some, it's like, look, 
I, I, I weigh my individual like rice cakes or whatever. <laughs> and then they go to the gym and, you know, and they don't fucking work hard. Right. Like you're not going to see that if you, people either give a shit or they, or they, or they, or they, or they don't. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I think, you know, that's why it's like, look, people will approach this stuff probably in a way that more reflects their personality. than they're like, oh, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm have to do it this way, you know, cause I have to be optimal or whatever. And it's like, no, people that people that are more detailed oriented are going to be more detailed oriented and people that don't like that aren't going to do it. That's just, it's that simple. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, and the other thing I was going to the, add there is like with the whole optimal, optimal versus not optimal thing. I, I do think that's what you were saying about personality is spot on because whether or not people are on the optimal train or not, it's, it's not really about what they say. It's like, it's more so about what they actually do. So, you know, I know people who like are totally seem superficially like they're on the optimal train, but then, you know, maybe they'll ask a question or they'll, or they're, or, or they're going to do something like in, in, in training and I'll watch them train. And it's like, no, like this is, these are, these are two categorically like completely separate things. So I don't actually think that any of the people mostly that are arguing against like the optimal thing are not trying to optimize things. I think that they just don't think that it's important enough for it to actually matter. But then but then weirdly enough, like when they actually get an opportunity to, to apply the, the, the techniques or, you know, the principles, it's like, it actually enhances their experience and it actually makes everything, uh, you know, it, it actually progresses their ability to uh, work harder, train harder for longer without seeing like these maladaptive consequences that they, that they might see otherwise. So it just, it just makes no sense to me. Like when, if you actually took, like, if anyone actually took like five minutes to think about it, like to actually just think about it rather than to just like say stupid, something stupid or hurtful on the internet, it's like optimal is not even the right word. It's like, it's not even about the word. It's kind of about like how you, like what your training lens is and like what you yourself ha like have had success or failure with personally. And sometimes that's just purely intellectual. Like you just, you just don't understand something. So it's, it's easier to dismiss it than to spend a year trying to deeply understand it and then, you know, see the value of it. So yeah, I I think a lot of it is just people what they like if they don't understand it then it fits on the side of the spectrum of not good. And if it's something that they even remotely understand then good. Like an example um you know, I posted like the clips of of Luke Lehman taking shots at like the stuff that we do, right? Of like oh, yeah. look, Cass is being pedantic about the six fibers in the fucking lower ladder or whatever <laughs> what not. You know, and then and then like and then like a couple of days later, there's a story posted and he's doing the step back hammer row. And mm -hmm. I was like, uh, that looks that looks like optimal, optimal training to me, because, you know, otherwise you just get on and use the machine. But no, you're like, you know, you're doing all the things to like hit six different fibers of your lat. And he's like, no, this is just, you know, classic foundational, whatever. And I'm like, what makes that exercise foundational, right? Because it's a machine and, and, and not a cable. Like I saw a similar example um, where somebody like they, they, the caption of their posts was like bashing iliac pull downs, right? And in, in, in their workout video, they're basically doing the chest supported sagittal, you know, pull down machine that is essentially, it's a chest supported iliac pull down. That's, but but, be, but what, what if you put 45s on it then it's no longer an optimal exercise it's now a foundational exercise like what is so so what about so if i i have, I have the prime prodigy in both the select rise and the plate loaded so if i use the plate loaded one it's a foundational exercise but yeah, if i use the selector rise then it's a optimal exercise right and i can only go heavy and hard and progressively overload the one that i put plates on and not the one that i that i moved the pin on like what what is the logic here um yeah speaking yeah, of this exactly. you just had one of the uh the anti-optimal you know you know kings or founders right out uh oh out yeah, gym, yeah 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 right how did yeah, that yeah. go give, give me the cliff notes oh man it was fantastic i mean uh so he was in um and we'll just say his name angus angus uh angus is angus is actually uh He's, he's a great guy. We had, we had a great time. And, you know, I think, um, 
I think he really wants the unblock from you. I don't know if it's going to happen, but uh, I don't, I, I don't see it happening personally, but um, yeah, he came in and he was just like, yeah, man, I just like, let's just train. Like I'm going to do whatever you do. And um, you know, we got into uh, as I told you, some of the pull around stuff, like the more vertical variations, we got into some of the press around stuff and he was totally like loving it like whole time. Um, and you know, it's, it, it also just goes to show like, I bet like 90% of the people who are, who are anti-optimal quote unquote, um, which by the way, I'm trying to use the word specific now because specific is a lot less polarizing. It's like, no, this is, I'm not going to say this is optimal, but this is just specific. And it, like I said, it doesn't have to be tissue specific. But You're specific. conceding the language, bro. <laughs> letting them win. <laughs> no, no. So um, I think what happens with like 90% of these people who are, you know, anti this, this, you know, optimal specific movement is they try the motion themselves. They probably a hundred percent, they definitely try the motion because they're like, Oh, here's this new thing I've never done before. Like I'll probably try it. They try it and they completely fuck it up in like every way imaginable. And then the second that they actually have like good direction or good coaching in the, in the motion, it's like, Oh my God, there it is. There's the whole game changer. So a lot of times it could just be, you know, it's often for me, the most helpful thing for, for teaching is not the, the verbal cueing. It's like the tactile type stuff. And so um, typically with the press and the pull around stuff, I find that people just, want to just be way too wide with everything um and so just the, the few minor tweaks there and he was you know he was having a he was having a blast so yeah it, it was good and it was fun to kind of you know see that happen and and, and come full circle you know yeah. um well that's evidence for why the biggest challenge for us is the people that are you know it's a copy of a copy of a copy and so then but then when somebody experiences the exercise they have the they have a extremely low chance of doing it properly or well enough to actually get the experience that they should. Right. Cause you know, I mean, I mean, I don't know, like when we started doing like, you know, our lat pull downs more sagittal with like the protraction and whatnot um, you know, you, that, that's something simple, but through that game of telephone on social media, like people just completely lost like what the arm path was supposed to be and what it, and like they're just doing all sorts of, of different things. Um, you know, so it's so easy for like, it's hard enough for people to see an exercise performed well, and then mimic it just through a video. So yep. as soon as it's a mimic of a mimic of a mimic, by the time it gets back, it's like, look, the person's probably using a similar machine. And that's, that may be like the only thing left that's actually similar about, about the exercise, <laughs> right? Like, it's like, okay, sure. you know, that's, that's okay. It, it, the guy's pulling on a cable. Like that's, that's really all that's in common at this point in terms of making it this exercise. Cause it's not closer to the, uh, the target exercise as any other random fucking thing that they'd just be grabbing a cable and, and pulling. Yeah. Up, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. As far as, as far as the unblock thing, you know, like, I mean, I, love debate right um and, and discourse right uh but one when when people like when people can't be objective right when there isn't actually like you know when you're debating with somebody and there isn't actually a search for for greater truth or when people just like lie like like whatever like the like you know some of the stuff from like the melbourne straight culture people or whatever it's like like this is just blat this is blatantly false right like um you know um and even if you confront them with that then they'll just sit there and like you know either shrug or whatever right so it's like there's no like to me it's like in those instances there's there's no point of discourse right like if somebody doesn't have good intentions like because e even if their intentions were to be like hey i want to show you that my method is right and your method is wrong right but that would mean that like you're coming with an objective opinion or the the data the information and argument for that right but if their only argument is is that i don't like what you do i have no i have no <laughs> i have no support for what i do i can't give you any logistical reason or argument for that but i'm just gonna hate on what you do to me it's like man those people are just like why give those people any time because you're never like they're, they're never going to be anything but a negative for, I mean, for your brand particularly, but I would say as an industry as a, as a whole, right? Like the people that have that mindset, it's like, 
you're not going to contribute anything, right? I mean, all you all you're going to do is hold people back from trying other things, right? When you don't really have a good case other than you don't understand it or 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 you don't like it, right? And the only you're the only way that you can attack those things is to straw man them in the most extreme way possible, eliminating nuance and either putting it out of context or or whatever, right? And to me, it's like when I see those behaviors, it's just like there's no reason to invest any time. Like I just want those people just not in the same world as me, right? Because yeah. it's just it's just it's just taking away from my ability to, you know, deliver my message. But you know, like at least people that like disagree with me give me the opportunity to be better. Cause either I'm going to get better at like explaining my own position. Right. And I'm going to acquire more evidence and reasons and logic behind it, or I'm going to learn something from their perspective that will allow me to evolve my thinking. Right. So, but when, you know, baseless hate, there's nothing, there's nothing to gain from it. Right. It's like, you're literally offering me nothing. Even if I'm a thousand percent wrong, you're offering no recourse of, well, then what is, what would be better? What is right? No, just you suck. Like, yeah, that's, that's the only, that's the only yeah. thing. Right. The other, so. the other people that fall into that camp too, are the uh, show your physique crowd. Yeah. It's like, I'll be, you know, talking about something completely, completely, uh, you know, not, not even something polarizing. It could be like, Hey, like if you want to train your biceps, do this thing. Uh, and they're like, bro, show your physique. Like why you post on the internet? Like you gotta be, you know, you got to be doing this, this, and this for a decade. And uh, so, yeah, I, I feel the same way about those people. Although their uh, message superficially may appear less hateful and more inquisitive, I think it actually mm -hmm. comes from the same place. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing wrong with wanting to see results, right? Yeah. But, you know, when it comes to the fitness stuff, like results, there's, it's, it's all, it's multifactorial, right? So just because you may have the, you may have an idea for the best exercise in the world. But that doesn't take away that like, oh, if you don't have good genetics, if you don't put in time and effort and all those things that, you know, that's that's not going to happen. And because it's multivariable, it makes it very hard for you to say, hey, this exercise is, you know, the best because these people have been doing it this way and these people haven't or whatever. Right? Because that just doesn't that doesn't exist. Right. There's no there's no randomized controlled bodybuilding going on. Everybody's just fucking doing every everything all the time with tons of different variables you got all sorts of different genetics, all sorts of different drugs being used and supplements <laughs> and diets and, you know, whatever. Right. And so it's like, well, what's working. And I'm like, well, what people are doing is they're finding some sort of combination that they think works for them. doesn't mean it's the best or whatever, but the common, like, you know, they might be drastically deficient in one area, but they're compensating in another area. And therefore they think that like everything that they're doing is good, even though it's just the, of the things they're doing, there's a net good, even though some of those things could be really inefficient. Um, you know, and so I don't think there's anything wrong with, you know, wanting to see evidence, but I think you're very, it's a very shallow thing to think that like, oh, you know, do this, like, like people will be like, oh, you know, like, does like, hmm, we'll take Paul Carter doesn't even have visible abs, right? You know, if it's about a bicep curl, it's like, well, how, what type of curl gives you visible abs, right? <laughs> like physics, the, the rules of physics are not dependent on somebody's body composition and things like that. So when it comes to these principles and things like that, you know, um, because there's a certain amount of intellect needed to understand them. I think that's a defensive thing of like, I don't understand this, but it's invalid because I've achieved success in a different area sure. than you have. Right. Like that's saying like, you know, let's like, you know, say somebody can, you know, hit a ball further than you, but you're like, yeah, but I can run faster than you. So it doesn't matter. I'm like, but they're two totally, they're two totally different things. They don't have anything to do with each other. Right. So I think, I think that's what's happening. You know, it's, it's just a, it's just people are, it's a dick swinging contest and people just want to have the contest that's in, in their favor. Right. Yeah. So that, that's kind of what they do. There's a, like I said, it's a, a lot of insecurity leads to a lot of gatekeeping. And that's just one of the byproducts is comments like that. Right. You know, but I don't think there's anything wrong with say, you know, being like, Hey, I want to see evidence of this or that or whatever. But I think that's where like, if, you know, if I'm looking at the content that you produce, that is, you know, a little bit, a little bit more absolute or whatnot, you know, it's like, whether they're using the memes or whatnot. That's one of the cons of not being able to have like, Hey, here's a, here's a long explanation. This is just one of the weaknesses of social media in general, right? Cause if you can give somebody a long explanation, 
you know, or a thorough enough explanation, then they may be less tempted to throw out those cards because like, you've been able to make it make sense to them in a way that they, they understand. Right. So that's like, if you want less of those comments, you're going to have to write some of the more boring things or whatever. Right. You know, and I mean, there's going to be a strategy to it. Right. Um, you know, I have, I have kind of wavered and changed what we do and, and whatnot. Right. You know, like, you know, if, if I want to make a post that says, yeah, you know, front squats suck for, for hypertrophy. Right. It'll get a ton <laughs> of engagement. Right. Um, but if I do a post that like analyzes the different types of squatting things or whatever, it won't get as much. But the thing is, is that I won't convert anybody's thought process by just coming out and saying front squats are bad for her person because everybody that likes front squats will be like, that's fucking stupid. You know, you know, show me your physique or whatever the hell it is. Right. Um, but if I put out some decent information, I won't reach as many people. But of the people that I reach, maybe a few people that will resonate with them and actually upgrade their thought process, right? And as a business person, those people are more likely to, you know, be more interested in more of your content and your courses and all of that other stuff. But the person that you just said, like, you just fucking crucified their favorite thing in the gym or whatever, right? That person's never buying anything from you. That person is now going to be part of creating the anti-you movement. Right. That's just that's just the reality of it is. Right. And this stuff scales over time. People love negativity more. Fear is more motivating than, you know, happiness or success. Right. So all of these negatives, like the algorithm is is built for that. So if you get sucked into doing just things for the algorithm that like you're going to reap what you sow, so to speak. So, yeah. Okay. And I think, and I think that there's the and last thing on that is that there is potentially a balance to be had where I think it's okay, you know, whether, whether it's morally or ethically reprehensible, I think is, you know, not, not, not the conversation for today, but I think it's okay to say something a bit edgy to maybe reach. Like, I think there is an argument to be made about reaching people who maybe wouldn't have been reached otherwise, who may, when they start to see a little bit more of the in-depth stuff, like as long as I said, like there's a balance, as long as they see some of that more in-depth stuff sort of scattered amongst the slightly more polarizing stuff, I think it ends up, you know, the scales end up tipping more positive than more negative. But I do agree that at either extreme, there are sort of uh, much higher magnitudes of either positivity or negativity. My suggestion, if I were going to try and find a compromise, you know, for the content that you make versus the content that I make, et cetera, would be like, you know, have the catchy, you know, the trigger fucking thing, have that on your first photo of the carousel. Right. But instead of just like, okay, like instead of stacking like the 10 memes on top of each other or whatever, it's not right? always, it's not always it's 10. All right. Sometimes yeah, it's four right. or five. Yeah. Whatever. Um, but what I would do is, is like, hey, you know, just go with the one trigger and then have all the have all the rest of it then be the nuance, the context, the like, because because what you want to do is you want to get the eyeballs. But after the eyeballs, you need to get the brain. Yeah. Right. So so I'd be like, OK, have just the, the cover there. That's your eyeballs. And then between your other nine carousels and your caption, get the brain. And essentially what I would like the point for the content that I make now and like we're we're constantly in the process of like, all right. I want to delete every fucking thing we've ever posted and, you know, just redo it all is it's like, now it's like, if we're going to post something, I'm like, look, we're going to post things. It's going to limit what we can post, but we're going to post things that basically are extremely hard for people to like come at and be antagonistic to or whatever, which, which limits the things that I can post. Right. But my goal is not to get my whole curriculum on Instagram, because even if I did put everything that I knew on Instagram, it wouldn't be in a format that would really benefit people anyway. My goal is to put out the minimum amount that I need there so that people go and actually consume the content in a way that's more conducive for delivering the message, right? Whether that be on our site or in our courses, et cetera. And it's like, okay, cool. I would much rather have, you know, that I put fewer of my ideas on social where they can get, you know, misconstrued but just put out the ideas that basically are going to give me the best opportunity to get those eyeballs and then get people to be interested in looking deeper into our ideas and to what we do in places where we can actually deliver a better message. Right. That's, that's, that, that would, that would be my suggestion. I'm not claiming to be a social media expert 
uh, by any means. A lot of people would be completely disagree with my approach, but I can tell you that her like per size of my following, our business has always been very good in terms of the quality of our following. Like tons of people are jealous. Like, cause when I used to do Q and A's or whatever, like one of the things Paul used to be like, man, you get good questions. I always get these dumb fucking questions. And I'm like, well, you post dumb content. So you could get, get like, <laughs> you like you, your following is a product of, of the content that you make, right? Like people don't follow you by like accidents or sometimes. Right. And, you know, sometimes actually, you know, when influencers would like tag us or whatever, we would get a flood of followers from that person. And then there'd be a period where it's just like, okay, that just kind of like changed my demographic slightly a little bit when I was smaller and it's all of a sudden, boom, you know, get a couple thousand new followers. And it's like, these people have no idea what we do or whatever. And it's like, okay, so I could easily cater to making content that those new people would like. And all of a sudden that would probably accelerate my growth. But what I'd rather do is keep making the content that is on brand and then those people that came over that are really going to be interested will stay. And the people that are like, Oh no, I'm not here for this. They will leave. Right. Like yeah. that to me, to me, that to me, that's actually, that's actually better. Right. you know, I mean, think of your online space as if it was a real space. Okay. If you had to fill, if you could fill a room with only 30 people, would you want those 30 people to be like the same proportion as what your Instagram following is? Right. Yeah. So <laughs> Probably not. You're you're thinking of you're thinking about like you know standing up and doing that lecture in that course or whatever. Yeah, that yeah, that seems, seems terrible. So instead of having this massive following, what if you had a smaller following, but it was high, higher quality? That's what I think you know we should lean towards. Okay, probably only have time for one more because I gotta get to an um a meeting here. Um so uh I wanna I wanna talk about the sensation thing and kind of see. So why don't you why don't I mean I've read a couple of your posts here, or whatnot. Um, but uh, the one that kind of stuck up was was basically had the message that you know if an exercise has a lot of sensation, then that probably means it's not ideal. So why don't you just give me your nuanced view of sensation right now and how you're using that in terms of like you know avoiding it, interpreting it, etc. Yeah. So I think. It's a tricky conversation because at least to have more broadly on, on some scale, because a lot of the exercises that I think are more appropriate orthopedically are exercises that you have to sort of understand the mechanical modeling to know why maybe they're better orthopedically. Right. And so, you know, it, for example, like something, the first one that comes to mind is like the frog pump. Like you have to kind of understand hip mechanics and, and, you know, basic physics and force to understand why that might be problematic for some people, you know, from, from an orthopedic standpoint. But if you didn't know any of that, you might just assume that like more sensation, more better kind of a thing. So for me, the number one priority is always just like the, the the mechanical modeling aspect of it and like how well does this fit the theory of like the basic physics stuff and then after that it's kind of like there are certain 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 circumstances under which i think sensation will be more pronounced or less pronounced based on the specific context of the exercise right so the sensation could change if you change the resistance profile the sensation could change when you um, change the relative length of the tissue, whether it be fully length and fully shortened, um, it obviously will change with fatigue. And those are all things that I kind of expect. So for example, if I'm doing like, you know, um, a squat versus a leg extension, those obviously will, will feel very different for different reasons. But as long as I can give myself a little bit of like an explanation as to maybe why that is, then I generally feel comfortable with accepting certain sensations versus not accepting others, uh, at least, um, at least initially. So in terms of just sensation as a whole, I think, I, I think it's important, but also also overvalued. So it's not that more sensation is worse. It's just that more sensation in the context of a particular scenario may not be um, what we're looking for, for example. So sensation to me is never something that I'm actively like seeking out, but more so just um, something that I'm trying to conceptualize as a byproduct of an exercise that serves a specific goal. Um, so oftentimes in the context of something that I may view uh, as, as more negative when it comes to the sensation based thing is like when people, when people 
use cues that intentionally give them more sensation, but don't necessarily add to the exercise. So like immediate red flag for me, for example, is when sensation goes up, but load goes down, um, you know, for the same, we'll say, uh, externally perceived range of motion. Um, that typically is one of the things that I find happens most often with people is, you know, whether it be like they're posting, like in the, in, in the group, um, with the, the trainers that I mentioned earlier, some people will post a video and they'll be like, oh yeah, I felt like really, really high, uh, contraction in my pack with this like press around. And I'll kind of see that, like, if I really zoom in on the video, they're using like, you know, they're like a 200 pound guy and they're using like, you know, the first plate on the weight stack and they're moving at like two inches at a time and they're like squeezing their arm into their body as they go. So kind of an extreme example, but just one to kind of illustrate something that I see across a lot of different scenarios. Um, so always obviously to be contextualized, but I find that where it ends up being problematic most is where it limits loading, not just necessarily in the same session, but up to a certain point of progression. So with the more like sensation based exercises that I think are problematic, you'll always find that a lot of times there's like a hard cap on where loading just like stops. And it's weird because it actually stops for a broad spectrum of people. So people who you would expect to be lifting like the, the entire stack for 20 reps are lifting the same amount as like the 120 pound female who like has been training for six months. And it's like, well, something's clearly not right here. So Typically, when you see that discrepancy, um, you also see um, just things in terms of either intent or just the biomechanics are are, are problematic. So that's kind of where my head goes in, in terms of the sensation based thing. Yeah. So the latter half there is much more on par with 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 our messaging, right? And that I mean, that's the messaging that I would like to see, you know, in the posts because the message that came across was is that more sensation is bad uh and i mean here it's like full full context like we have all of these fancy motions and whatever you know that that people like to think you know they're super optimally overcomplicated whatever um i feel i get good sensations in all of our exercises right like significantly more than than, than many other things um but the thing but i think that the later part of your message was it's like well you know, more, more sensation shouldn't be seen as a negative, but in the context of when you see sensation going up, despite other conflicting information, which would be, it doesn't seem to match the physics or biomechanics, or we see loading decrease. Like those are the things. So when I look at sensation, sensation is that in beginners, it should almost be something that's like, it's relatively inert because there's so many reasons that you can feel something and you're going to have different types of sensations, short or stretch muscle or movements that require more coordination, have a different relative effort sensation than isolation movements, all of that sort of stuff. Um, so I think it just has to be one of those things where, yeah, we don't necessarily pursue it, but we don't have to avoid it either. Right. Like it shouldn't like, cause to be honest, I mean, the more advanced you get, the more likely like sensation could be a useful like like kind of small guide like if your arm path is off or a little bit as long as you're taking the other context in there because it should be like okay it's not that i just feel this part of my muscle better but it also feels better on the joint i'm also able to you know do a little bit more load there or i feel that the fatigue is a little bit more you know directed where i want it it's not more in the stabilization etc you know that sort of thing so you know, when I'm looking at that, like, cause, cause there's a ton of good exercises that are going to result in a high degree of sensation. And so I think if we put the message out that more sensation is bad to me, that's, that that's destructive to how people need to be utilizing that tool. I think the message needs to be like, look, sensation is itself is not sufficient enough to navigate how well an exercise is working or how good your setup or, or whatnot is right it can be one, one proxy, just like, you know, like, well, soreness isn't a proxy or isn't this a single proxy for progress or whatever. Right. Um, but you can also dismiss that like, Hey, if an exercise makes you sore there, well, obviously that muscle was doing something there or whatever, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best. Like there's all sorts of different reasons that you get sore versus not sore and stuff like that. So, but if you compound that on all of the other data, Right. Then what you can try and see is, is like, well, where, where are the scales balancing between this information saying I'm on the right track versus, you know, maybe this is, isn't an ideal approach or I'm, 
I'm pursuing kind of the wrong direction in terms of my setup or my technique or how much intention that I'm applying. Right. Um, you know, and again, like, like your, you know, meatheads that are barely moving any weight and they're getting all of that feel, right. What are they like? They're, they're, they're basically doing intention training, right. You know, which this is one of the things that I think is like, you know, um, if, if you have the op, if you have the option between proper loading versus intention, I would always take proper, proper loading. Right. Um, so then it's like, well, how do you get that person, you know, out of that? Right. Cause you don't want to say the sensation to go down. You just want them to find that sensation with, you know, four times as much weight. Right. That's, that's essentially, that's essentially what you're going to go. Right. You want, you want that sensation to the, be the result of, you know, we need to make the mechanical tension to move the load, not you're just co-contracting to squeeze that muscle as much as possible. Right. Um, so I think that, you know, when we're looking at that message, because again, this is where then people will straw man that argument, right? So then you'll have a, you know, you'll have three or four people get on a podcast together in their jorts and stuff and be like, yeah, what are these idiots talking about? Like, if you feel a muscle, that means it's not working like the fucking idiots and whatever, because that that's what happens, right? So this is where like, you know, again, just something like the iliac pull down, all of a sudden a, a narrative gets associated with that. So, you know, my plea would be, hey, man, on these things like this, well, this is basically like, this is a, this is an important principle that people are going to use to navigate their training career, right? The last thing that we want to do in that instance is put out a message that could be, that could send them down the wrong path. I think, you know, if we want to be like, you know, a little bit more hyperbolic of like, Hey, this is the best delt exercise ever or whatever, you know, like, sure. Cool. Like, I mean, you know, people take that less seriously, but then when you take a principal piece of thing and be like, all right, sensation is junk or progressive overload is garbage or, you know, you know, whatever it is, like those are not helpful messages to me. Right. And to me, what that does is it, it it's going to eliminate certain people and likely the, it's going to eliminate certain people that would really benefit from what you have to say from actually now listening to what you have to say. Right. Cause if you take something and you throw a partial truth or falsehood, falsehood, falsehood out of it or about it, what's going to happen is anybody that understands that to a more nuanced level is now going to assume that you don't have a nuanced level with your other sure. ideas, right? Um, so when you're talking about the principles, I think that's the most important time. When you're talking about like, hey, you know, like, oh, this, whatever, this is great, or this is better, whatever. Like when you were, were looking at specific exercises, it, you can be more hyperbolic in there and you can throw it up or whatnot. And then you can have all of your, you know, like I said, you can have your other carousels or you have your whole caption or, or you have your YouTube video, whatever, where you can like then, then pull back to, you know, the appropriate context to that. But it's not that bad because like, you know, if you think one exercise is the best, cool. Like that's not like, you know, there's no, there's no reason for me to be like, all right, well, this guy's an idiot. Cause you think that's the best exercise. And I think this other one's like, you know, cause there's going to be individual variances and stuff like that. But when we're talking about principles, if you like, if you throw up a principle and then you're like, oh, this is trash or this is good or whatever. And, and it's in a bad light. Then I think you're more likely to lose people that otherwise would have been it's because everybody likes to post on like YouTube for a while. The way everybody grew their YouTube is like, Hey, the three top chest exercises, the three top triceps. Like and those were like the most popular thing. And there was no, nobody ever actually provided evidence why these were the good exercises. Right. Or if they did, they just cherry picked a few, you know, pieces of evidence that went with that. But there wasn't like, Hey, you know, we've done an extensive study of all of these exercises or whatnot and compared them and whatnot. Like, as far as I know, the only people that the only people that are doing extensive comparisons of exercises, you know, are us like outside of like the small amount of published research that we get. Right. So, yeah, you know, people, people want that simple answer when they just want to know like, Hey, what are some good things I could do to go to the gym and train chess? Right. <laughs> and as long as your three best exercises aren't like three love, like the worst exercises, then that's probably fine. Right. Um, but when we start to distort the principles, I think you alienate yourself from people that have that are interested in their this information, but have some sort of prior education where they're immediately going to be like, it smells like bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. Even though like, like in this conversation, you gave what I would consider a very, you know, 
a much better answer to like, well, how do you look at sensation? But <laughs> if I didn't like, if I didn't know that you had come to N1 and you, you'd heard all of this stuff or whatever, and I just saw that post, right. Then I wouldn't assume that that would have been the answer that I would have gotten from you. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Fair that enough. That makes sense. Right. Yeah. So um, anyway, that, so yeah, I think we're on the same page in this context when it comes to the sensation thing. Right. Um, but not so much. Okay. So we're almost out of time here. So I'll just go with one like here. This will be one that divides the room. All right. Can we, can we, can we, can we adequately train? It's 2023. <laughs> can we train the inner and the outer <laughs> head of the biceps differently? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. Well, it, it can't be both. It's got to be one or the other. Yes and no. Um, can there be a muscular can you set yourself up in a way wherein one head of the bicep may contribute more to each individual rep and at the end of the day may get more total stimulus than another head of the bicep yes but will that make a meaningful difference from a uh, superficial aesthetic standpoint probably not for a majority of people However, what I would say is that um, training the different positions of, um, of we'll say, rotation at the shoulder, abduction, adduction, flexion, extension, um, has huge, uh, we'll say, benefits in challenging and, and controlling different portions of the range, the total range of motion of the shoulder joint. So, um, you know, I think most people, when when they read that, will think, "Oh my God, um, I can do an exercise that only is going to simulate my outer bicep or the fuck, you know, the peak, whatever people are calling it." Um, but the way that that post goes on to explain, there is an ability to create a shift and bias based on. Uh, we'll say uh, fiber orientation relative to to uh, path of loading uh, and direction of loading, but there probably isn't a way to uh, grow one head of the bicep fifty percent more than the other at the end of the day. So yes and no. So okay, so there's always going to be a limit to how much you can, we'll say, bias something like in terms of synergist at a joint, right? Like if you're training knee extension, you know, all the quads are working. If you're training knee flexion, all the knee flexors are working, right? But to varying degrees. So there's always going to be components of that, right? Um, so let me let me ask you this then. Where, what, where do you think the limit is in terms of how much we can bias something, right? You So it sounds like you think that it's below the threshold of what would be aesthetically relevant. Yeah. So, okay. Is, um, is that just for biceps? What about for, what about these iliac pull downs that you do, sir? No. So what, <laughs> what I would say is that portion of the question would depend far more on what you guys would call the other thresholds. So I do think that it can make an aesthetic difference, but I, but that's different from saying that I think that it will for most people. Okay. Does that make sense? So, Let's, let's, let's look at, let's look at what evidence we do have in terms of our ability to bias exercises with different things. Right. Um, can I just, can I just add one yeah, other ahead. point quickly? Mm -hmm. um, I do think that it also depends on the extremes of like how specific you are with the positions and, and we'll say how deviated you are from the other uh, from the other potential tissues that could contribute. So in my mind, if we, if we take the biceps example, right. And you go to the extreme, you know, position we'll say of like a uh, long head of the biceps, right. So you're, you're in that flexed, abducted, externally rotated position that to me, that sort of shift in bias would be of a different magnitude than something that was, we'll say in a similar degree of, of, of rotation, but maybe less flexion. Right. So there's sort of like um, extremes within both specific paths of motion. And the more that you deviate to an extreme, the more that you could potentially say um, that a set for long head may actually be mostly distinct from a, a set for the short head. 
So for example, if I were to do that flexed abducted externally rotated curl, and then I were to go into something that was more adducted, relatively extended, relatively internally rotated, I would probably not see very much of a performance drop from here to here, but I would see much more of a performance drop from maybe something that was even just in a different degree of rotation here to here, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, if I think the message would be like, if you're going to buy something, don't, you're not going to like go to 2% 2 in the direction. Like you would go all like, to me, it's like, if you're, if you are getting to the point where you're really trying to buy specific tissues, you should go as far in the direction and get the absolute moat, like the largest degree of bias out of that, that, that you can, um, you know, and yes, I, you know, a biased exercise for one muscle versus like it's the antagonist or the synergist that it's most different from would be a greater degree than something that was, that was in between, but that should be, you know, that's just like saying that, you know, a uh, sternal press, is going to be more similar to clavicle and costal than a clavicle is to a costal press just because they are, you know, the yeah. motions are just, just similar. Um, so let's take, uh, so let's look at what we have. I mean, some of the best, best examples of looking at this would be like the stuff on the range of motion. Um, because when, when it comes to the factors of like, well, what's going to determine our ability to bias this tissue, right? We have the neurology X aspect, which is basically setting up the mechanics for this to most to favor a particular muscles motion, right. And the, and the forces it's contributing. Um, but then we also have the ability to change the length of that specific muscle relative to other things. So for example, we look at the, the research on seated versus lying leg curls, right? Okay. Um, so just with those two exercises, just the difference of a little bit of muscle length is enough to change the hypertrophy response, right. To a, to a significant degree, right. So all the, the, the longer, the bi the biarticular hamstrings, right. And the seated leg curl all got significantly more hypertrophy. Okay. Um, and then the short head of the biceps femoris, which just, you know, for the most part does not cross the hip right? Much more similar between exercises. The sartorius has a very similar function at the knee as the medial hamstrings, right? Like its insertion is just basically right along in that same pisanserine area. The sartorius had the inverse relationship because it is lengthened in hip extension. So the yeah. lying leg curl got significantly more hypertrophy for the sartorius and then the seated leg curl significantly more for the hamstrings so to me i'm looking at that and like right there that's evidence that simply by just manipulating hip position to put more stretch on the tissue that you were looking for is enough even though these have relatively synergistic functions right very similar to all of the elbow flexors having synergistic functions right that simply changing that hip position was enough to get in either scale significantly different hypertrophy. So when we're looking at something like the long head and the short head of the biceps, okay, you know, if we're just looking at the short positions or whatever, it's like, okay, we, you know, we have those, but honestly, like from a hypertrophy perspective, when you add on the fact that like, well, I can position my shoulder, not just so that Hey, this muscle is neurologically going to be recruited more because it matches the biomechanics more, but I can put a greater stretch mediated response into that specific tissue by being in the shoulder position that puts a significant greater amount of stretch on that. And that's not something you're going to be able to accomplish in just a mid range exercise that like both muscles are being recruited neurologically, like fairly decent amount because it's just somewhere in between. It's an omni position, if you will. Right. In that case, it might be like, cool, yeah, if I just do more volume of these things, then I could like, so, so let's say, so instead of doing four sets in the short head position and four sets of the long head position, what if I just did like six sets of Omni exercises, would that be equivalent? That's the question I have on the gastroc study they did, where it's like they did the medial, the lateral with a different foot placement, and then they did this straightforward. And so in both the medial and the lateral like positions, the relative head of the gastroc hypertrophied more, right? Um, but on average, like the head that wasn't biased, what got more in the Omni. So the Omni wasn't as good 
for the biased one, but it was better for the non-biased one, which is exactly what we would expect it to be somewhere in the middle. So then the question is, well, like how many sets of the Omni would it take to equal the other things or whatnot? So you could make the argument that if we're not looking at all of the factors that like, okay, I could just make up with volume and effort to a certain degree, not using these specific positions and somehow still get like a similar hypertrophy. Um, but what you can accomplish is the stretch mediated response by just going into an ambiguous place like that. So I think a lot of people underestimate these tools, right? And a lot of that too is, is that, you know, for the longest period of time, we haven't looked at the nuances of exercises and what the actual components, like it would just be like, Hey, this exercise is good for this. This is good for that. This bodybuilder like this, but like very few people are like, what, what is this actually doing? Right. And how would you individualize that to make sure it's doing that same thing for every individual that performs it, you know, whatnot, what is it actually getting to a full stretch? What is it lining up, et cetera? Um, because, you know, bodybuilding research is dirty because people aren't just doing one exercise. They're doing tons of exercises and they're doing tons of different programs over time and, you know, whatnot. And, you know, life isn't the same time during one program, they might have a ton of life stress, you know, in another program, they had no life stress and they doubled their, you know, anabolics or whatever the hell it is. Right. So it's like you, that data is very, very hard to interpret. But now that we have this stuff, if we take the principles of what we're seeing in the literature of like, Hey, we know that changing exercises and getting a different neurological response, that there's not a perfect correlation when we're looking at stuff like EMG. Um, but when you take it to the extremes that we do, we tend to see a very good correlation between, you know, activation, if you will, it's not really activation, but for lack of a better word, um, electrical signal and the response that we're getting. Um, and then you, but, but from a hypertrophy perspective, we have to take into account, well, what about muscle length and loading and stability and all the things when you compound those things on top of each other, I think we're massively underestimating how much you can bias a specific tissue, especially for or a specific goal. And then you layer programming on top of this, which means that if you did, you know, whatever, 12 sets of omni elbow flexion exercises, right? Okay. Let's just, let's just say that's like close to your maximum volume tolerance or whatever, right? Like there's going to be a certain period of time before you can adequately perform with those again. But let's say it's Monday and you do some lengthened stuff for your long head, maybe do some short stuff for your short head, something like that or whatever, right? Then come Thursday, the muscle that you didn't smash the length in position is going to be very, very ready to train, even though the other one may have carried over some longer fatigue, right? So all of a sudden now, the your ability to manipulate how you can use volume and stuff can start to get significantly more efficient right so and when we're looking at this is like okay we can only we have the constraints of like it's just what you can get in a single workout and we're not going to bring in the you know the muscle length as a factor you'd be like all right the our ability to bias is smaller but as soon as we actually say like well as soon as we actually start extending that bias to also looking at the stretch mediated response now that's bigger and then as soon as we break out of the window of a single workout and look at it, this actually opens up programming options and potentially allows me to get more volume of stimulus with less fatigue. Well, now that stretches even further. Okay. Now that's a lot to unpack in a, in a post, right? Um, but so my suggestion, or I should say my suggestion, but my, my, my thought when I see that, like, oh, can you do this? And I'm like, well, is that a question that should be asked right there? right? Or in that format? Because to me, it's the answer is, well, yes. But the answer to how is then much more complicated. So if it's like, what I would say is, it's like, this is your opportunity to go cross platform for YouTube, but like, all right, well, you could be like, hi, or it's like, okay, how could you do this? Here's two exercises that I like for this, right? You know, and then you could be very, we'll say conservative on like the claims you're making towards how much bias there is or isn't. Right. But you could talk about the principles that would affect it. And that's kind of the message that I do. Right. Cause I don't have like nobody outside of us is researching these motions. Right. And so I just know that like every, every bit of, every bit of information I have, if I put it out there, the counter is like, well, it's biased because it, it's yours. Right. Mm -hmm. So my, my, my response to that is, is like, well, okay, I'm just not bothered going to, I'm not going to bother trying to win anybody over by just showing them all the data we have. Um, but I'm just going to use the, use the tools that we have to continue making what we do better. 
And then from there, I can hopefully explain the principles behind what we're doing in a way that then gets people to at least not be adverse to trying it, right? If that's yeah. something that they want to focus on. And also just making sure people maintain the context of like, look, is this is this a worthwhile pursuit for you at this particular at this particular period of time, right? And there's a lot of factors that go into that. Um, I got to get going soon. So if there's any closing things you want to say, let people know where to find you, et cetera, um, go ahead and throw it out there. Yeah. I mean, just my name on Instagram and everything goes through there. And, you know, for, for you, Kasim, and, and for everyone else, my last name is actually pronounced Giannis. If you didn't. Giannis? Uh, yeah. Okay. Which, you know, I, I know new, 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 new thing. I think you could adjust, but uh, yeah, just, I, I thought I would get that out there because most people say Yanes, which most of the time I'm fine with, you know, I don't say anything, but like, since you asked, you know, Giannis, Giannis. The nuances is, matter. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But yeah, no, I appreciate you having me on. I love this talk. I'd be happy to do another one at, at some point in the future if you ever wanted to. And, you know, I, it's, I definitely done a lot of thinking about obviously a lot of the topics that we covered today, but even more in depth on, on some of the nuances of the training stuff that maybe we can, you know, make a greater proportion of, uh, you know, the next time we talk as opposed to the the social media stuff too. But it's, it's, it's all interesting to me. So I, you know, I enjoy talking to you. So, awesome, man. Have a good one. All right, man. You too.